Eric Tarr. He is the Senate Finance Chairman. E, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us today. Hey, good morning. How y'all doing today? We are doing well. Thank you kindly. Uh, first question for you is uh, your favorite cookie, uh, Eric. Uh, this... My favorite cookie. Yeah, usually, you know, it depends on the morning. If I'm drinking coffee, usually it's like a chocolate chip. If I'm drinking something sweet, probably more like a peanut butter cookie. So how's that? Those are the two big ones right now. <laughs> yeah. Matt, <laughs> yeah, Matt yeah. Miller, one of our co-hosts here, brought in cookies this morning. I got the Nutter Butter. Gilstrap got the famous Amos chocolate chip cookie. And Dylan got the soft chocolate chip cookie. So, this is you know, it's hard to go wrong, but it's it's a good debate. You know, which which one uh, tops the tops the list here yeah. in any given day for sure. My I son's said, getting. I don't mind trying them to see. Oh yeah, a sample. <laughs> My youngest son's getting married November twenty fourth, and uh, yeah, we're families from uh, Italy here, so the Italian cookie table is a huge part of a wedding, and we've got a s serious cookie table going for this thing. There's going to be, I'm going to guess. Five or six hundred cookies at this thing. Oh my gosh! You know that's doing some research. Yeah, and I, I may be underselling it. And uh, how many different varieties? I would. I'm, right now, I'm I'm hearing about ten. Ten at least at this time. These traditional Italian cookies. Some of those will be in, in, indeed included. Yes. So do you have to pick one, or do you get to go through and say, okay, I want these fifteen cookies? The great thing about being Italian, Eric, is you can eat as much as you want as of anything you want whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, as long as you've got I'll a glass of milk, thing. you can just keep going. <laughs> hey, I was at the Spring Hill uh, Bakery down here the other day. I was um, yeah. on a election day taking around some sweets and pastries and stuff around some of the poll workers and uh, went into uh, Spring Hill at 2 o'clock. It was like 2.30 in the afternoon, somewhere in there. And that place was absolutely packed. But me and a guy were sitting there talking. Don't it, never met him before. We were sitting there talking. said, you know, just to have a gallon of milk and sit there overnight, it would be it would be a legendary <laughs> night. <laughs> that would be that would do it, right? Hey, uh, are you familiar with the Kanawha County voting issues that uh, emerged in this last election, Eric? At all? I'm not. No, I'm, uh, the Kanawha County stuff. Uh, um, uh, I'm not really keen on what's going on there right now, as far as any uh, conflict. So, uh, what's going on? Uh, I won't get into it then because, you know, whatever. But I know there was an issue with, I think, 30,000 ballots out of Kanawha County election night. But um, we'll move on to another topic, and that is the sure. state's finances. I know we missed by $15 million the October revenue numbers. I was just talking with Eric Householder about that. He said that was more of a timing issue than it was a concern about the budget. Uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I'm not alar alarmed at all on, on what we have here on the – uh, relative revenue estimates, because when we look at, personally, what I look at is how we're doing year over year for the same year to date numbers uh, to look at a comparison, because estimates are, you know, they're, they're just that they're an estimate, you can go through and target it. And, and we've, um, since over the past, I don't know, probably six years now, um, the estimates, we really try to suppress a lot in order to be able to um, Make sure you've got those one-time funds for things that are needed for one-time uh, expenditures. So, and that's where things come into surplus and supplementals. So, um, at, after you've taken care of all your operational expenses of the state, and so the, when you're looking at estimates, um, these estimates might be a little bit under what a probably a suppressed estimate is, is, is the way I would say it. So, about 14 million under. But that's it's still not it's not a huge thing, you know, on nearly six billion dollars in revenue that you'll see come through. So, um, and it's, and it's kind of forecasted, you know, we, we started looking back, um, oh, seven years ago, maybe, um, looking at, um, a forecast looking forward and five to six years out to see how the trend line would go on revenue. If we did certain types of policies, like the tax reductions that we did and those type of things. And what we're seeing right now is probably, we're probably about two years ahead of schedule of getting to what I would see that your, your revenue to expenses are going to be nearly flat. And the reason we're about two years ahead is that we overspent relative to the tax cut that we did for the past two cycles. But it's not a huge overspend. Um, the, so for to go in and do a 21 and a quarter percent tax cut um, on income taxes, plus all the personal property tax credits that, that we've implemented as well as a legislature, that – Revenue has dropped uh, 21 and a quarter percent. It'll drop another six uh, percent come January, but we're only 12 percent down on our personal income tax. But to do all that and, and stay above 
your expense line, we needed to spend no more than 3% growth a year. And so we, we spent about four and a half a couple of years ago. This last one we spent a little over 5% growth. And so when you're not holding those to at least a 3% or less, uh, you're dipping below um, that trend line so that you're starting to see a little bit of a deficit. So, But it follows it. So there's still, if we have to correct, we can correct, but I don't think we'll have to. We've, we've stored away a, a lot of cash in um, different areas to hedge against any fluctuations as we see our income tax, tr- tax start to phase out over time. So uh, I feel good about what we're seeing. When you calculate whether or not you missed a revenue estimate in one direction or the other, do you take into account income from investments from the funds that are stashed away? Not really. We, we take in, we take into account the 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 income from the funds that are stashed away, in that we want to make sure that they're sufficient. There, you don't see one dropping off the edge of a cliff. And so right now, what we see is growth in those, um, both in our rainy day fund and our income tax reserve fund. Um, we still are paying ahead really well in our pension system. Our pensions are all still very strongly funded. So the, the things that we have that are um, that affect your credit rating. So so and this is where it, that comes more into play is that keeping those those stores of cash and your what's called the consolidated fund, which is like what you'd operate out of your home, your checkbook, paying your electric bills, paying uh, your mortgage, and those type of things. That's the consolidated fund. As long as as that is as flush, our pensions pensions are flush. Uh, our rainy day reserve fund is flush. And then our income tax reserve fund stays sufficient as we're starting to go through until we start trending back up on that revenue cycle. Um, then our credit rating is is likely to stay very strong for the state as well. And that keeps expenses down overall uh, for things on bonding issues. Um, and when you look at West Virginia right now, we, we are very solid on all those fronts. So um, those don't necessarily go into account for this $14 million that, uh, that's under estimate for year to date. Um, and just to give you one example, you know, there's there's $1.3 billion in rainy day reserve fund, and we're $14 million under estimate. So there's there's a lot of room for error that we've made in there because West Virginia is going such a growth change, and you do need to have there because something, you know, one of the things that's you can expect is something unexpected is going to happen. And so keeping those stores um, flush with cash for when that happens is important until we get to where we're on a steady trend line again. I want to shift gears, and then I know John and Matt have some questions for you as well. Uh, if you if you don't mind commenting on this, uh, take us behind the scenes in the Game of Thrones that's going on right now to replace Senate President Craig Blair, and uh, whether or not you have any interest in the Senate President position yourself. First, I'll tell you that uh, Craig said to tell you all hello, so I, you know, I'm talking to y'all's neighbor here on a daily basis up here, and uh, Craig's been through a few speaker races and Senate president races in his time um, and serving what's near 20 years up here in the legislature, I think. So, um, you know, he's a, uh, he's a, uh, we, we will sorely, the legislature, the state of West Virginia and this Senate will sorely miss uh, Craig Blair. I tell you, he's a, he's a, he's a voice of reason and a, and a voice of experience up here. Um, but, um, thank you. You know, it's it's a family thing when you're when you're talking about a Senate president race. When the, and then and on these interviews on the, across the state, and I get these questions, and I can't blame anybody for asking them. But it really is it's a family matter. So if you have a real important thing that's that's uh, probably confidential to your family, and you're pulling everybody around the dinner table to to collectively make a decision that everybody understands, that's kind of what it's like um, going through a Senate president's race. And so we do have several people within our caucus who are interested in being Senate president. And we have a caucus of incredible people. Uh, we we got a lot of good people up here. Um, and what I will tell you, and this is um, my experience, is that the caucus gets it right for what the state needs and what the Senate needs at that time. They, they always do, When when at least in my experience up here. When, when we needed um, a change agent, we got Bill Cole. You know, so and and that he was the right guy at the right time. Uh, when we needed a marketer for for West Virginia, we we got Mitch Carmichael. That was the absolute guy we needed at that time. When we needed somebody who was a fiscal hawk, who also had the experience of um, big change, 
that had been happening, we got Craig Blair. And um, that's uh, so the caucus gets it right. That's what I can tell you. And because it's very deliberative, you know, you talk here about the Senate being a deliberative body. Well, there's few things we deliberate more on than who's going to be the next Senate president. So um, that's probably as about as deep in the weeds as I can get with it because it is a still mm -hmm. dinner table discussion. And is there a scenario by which Craig Blair would serve as an interim governor before Patrick Morrissey would take over? You know, yeah, there is. If uh, and this we're in a um, a pretty unique circumstance there because of our governor going uh, having been elected to the U.S. Senate, and as as he would go in, if if he were to take advantage of the seniority benefits for for U.S. Senate, so. When it comes to committee placements and those things, if, um, if he seeks committee placements and wants to get more favorability on there, as they have new members coming in, the, the earlier you begin serving, the more seniority you have relative to those new members. And the more seniority you have, the more liberty you have to choose which committees you'd like to serve on. Uh, now, I'm sure there's other benefits to go along with that seniority as well. So if, uh, if Governor Justice and Senator-elect Justice decides that uh, that's the path he'll take, then um, before Patrick Morsey is sworn in as governor, then the lieutenant governor will serve as governor. And Craig, as Senate president, sits as lieutenant governor. So, yeah, it, there's, a, there's a scenario where there could be about a week or so there that, uh, that Craig Blair will be, would be our next governor. So we would go from having no Eastern Panhandle governors ever to having two in one week. That's an interesting. <laughs> you could, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you guys you guys have are having a stellar year. <laughs> Mr. Gilstrap. Well, I, I started taking notes too late on this, but you said we always pick right. So when we need the marketer, we, we got one governor. We needed the uh, big change. We got another governor. We needed a fiscal hawk. We got a different governor. What do we need now? I mean, not governor, president, uh, Senate uh, president. What do we need now in you know, the Senate president? We need somebody who can move a conservative agenda effectively forward. Um, and the reason I say that, if you look at uh, where we sit right now, um, the Republicans, and especially conservative Republicans, have an opportunity like we have never had. You have, from top down, you're going to have a Republican. Uh, United States president, you're going to have a Republican majority in the Senate, Republican majority in the House, a conservative Republican governor, mega MAGA majorities in the in the House and the Senate, and so you, you're we've got opportunity to really promote that faith, family, freedom agenda, um, and capitalize on all the economic prosperity that uh, that that economic philosophy brings. By putting um, the guy who can get all that done at the at the, at the top, and it, you know it takes incredible support and guidance of each of those members that really see that opportunity, and they want somebody who can help them get their agenda done, which falls into the collective agenda of the Senate. And so that's uh, and I think that's where the debate is. So as the transition happens, I, I presume it's already begun with um, Governor like Morrissey. Are you sensing a a change in priorities from from the the Justice Administration to the Morrissey administration? Are, are there big changes coming? Yeah, yeah, and I'm excited about those changes too. You know, I've had, got to have a few conversations with Patrick here along the way, um, and he um, um, is really focused on, on getting government to what government should be. And and I like that. You know, you've heard, um, I guess, a lot of the terms that might be used year over year over year, right-sizing government or uh, shrinking government and all that stuff, but you really got to get to what that means. And to, to me, and I think from discussions I've had with uh, Governor Morsi or Governor-elect Morsi, is that getting government to do what government should do and only what it should do. And that gets, gets government back to more, I think, of what the Founding Fathers envisioned is that you have a a small government that protects the freedom of the people and then serves the people. And so as we do that, one of the things I think that Jim Justice did not do well and I was frustrated with with in, in his term as governor is that he really didn't grab hold of the agencies and get involved and understand them. And for that, 
the the agencies have kind of went amok, and they were amok before him as well. And we need a we need a governor who will go in and be an operator within the executive agencies. And I think Patrick's going to be that way. And I, I think um, also in the discussions around our Senate, I think our Senate's going to be eager to support him on that agenda. Because if you look at going forward on reducing – like a big, a big platform of just about anybody up here says we want to eliminate this personal income tax and, um, and get personal property taxes under control. So there's, there's several ways you do that. Um, one is that you have economic growth that's so aggressive that the, the economic growth is growing faster than your CPI. And so for having controlled spending – uh, and you get that growth above it, you can take that and return those those dollars to the people of West Virginia for having that economic growth. Um, another way that you can do it is that if you don't can't get enough there, then you can do revenue swaps. Well, you would start looking at what's the fairest tax and what tax falls most on the people of West Virginia versus the people that pass through West Virginia. So you look at tax swaps and those type of things. The third thing that you can do, which is a huge political opportunity at this time, is get it to where you're not wasting taxpayer dollars through ineffective, muddy, sluggish executive agencies. And in order to, to have those further reductions in going forward, I anticipate the two big ones that will fall in front of us under Governor Patrick Morsey's administration is going to, you're going to see another uptick here in a couple of years significantly of economic growth beyond CPI just because of all the jobs that have been created and are, that, are, that are sticks are still coming out of the ground. And you go in and you make government more efficient. You you get the you reduce that that just that waste of money that doesn't go to where you're you think it's going. So that produces more opportunity to accelerate that tax reduction. So um, I think you're going to see an excited legislature to help him get that done. Eric, this is Matt Miller, and and you mentioned the the direction hopefully for this next Senate president being to to move that conservative agenda forward effectively. Uh, when you look at a supermajority of Republicans in the legislature as a whole, that sounds like it should be easy to do, but sometimes it's not. What is that challenge with so many in that majority party, but probably a lot of different ideas within it as well? Yeah, it's, it's the um, diversity of the state regionally. And so when you, when you look at any given, I'm, I'm going to speak to the Senate uh, more so than the House. I would, I would Probably Eric's householder was probably in the good one to ask about that in the House. Uh, but for the Senate, the Senate districts are set up um, very differently across, across each person. So, you, like for instance, you know, I might have, I've got um, four counties in in my district, and of those four counties, one of those is an entire county, and the other three are split in about in half. And then you may have somebody else who's got seven counties in their district, and it's a large geographical area. And you may have somebody else who's got uh, one county in their district, and so if, if if that's the case, then their interest in what the people that are electing them can be different. So you have to look at the commonalities that we have to get a majority vote within the Senate. Well, coming up prior to this one, what would happen on on the most conservative policy is that a on the really, really tough stuff in the Senate, we would be split about 50-50. And that makes it really, 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 really tough when you're split 50-50 across those those diverse representatives of the people who voted them across the Senate, voted them into office across the Senate. And well, I don't think we're 50-50 anymore. I think uh, we're sitting probably closer to, to 75-25, 80-20 with this new legislature coming in on – on having the you value that faith family freedom agenda just as much as you value economic prosperity and we can walk and chew gum at the same time you know as a, as a conservative republican leadership and i think that's what we'll do um so that's uh that's where it's been tough in the past i just i, I think that um right now for um what most Families, I think, in, in West Virginia, and it looks like uh, in this election across the country, I think the country is finally recognizing that West Virginia's politics have been right because uh, the way this ele presidential election went. Um, that I think that you'll, you'll see us moving that ball a little further down the field on both those fronts. Um, 
with this new legislature. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope I get this right, that Craig Blair would always say, rising tides raise all ships or lift all ships. Is that a challenge sometimes across such a diverse state to be able to convince the folks from the southern part of needs and how it will affect them in, you know, with, with legislation that maybe seems to help the eastern panhandle more and or vice versa, where, you know, we need to recognize sometimes, uh, you know, how the, the the decisions that are going to be so effective to the southern part of the state are going to help us in the eastern panhandle as well. Yeah, you know, that the rising tide lifts all um, ships is, I firmly believe that. And and you have to, um, it has to be a big tide. And that, I guess, is the, is the way to say it. And that's what we're seeing. We're, we're getting a big tide. And I can't allude to those now because of what those discussions are. But we, the companies that are coming in um, to West Virginia that are Fortune 100 and above companies that we're still going to be seeing announcements in Q1 and Q2, you know, the first quarter, second quarter um, of this of 2025. In addition to all the ribbon cuttings for the stuff that's coming out right now, those jobs are going to employ people across the state. Even if you got the, the specific business located in, say, and I'll give you an example, and this is the one that's probably the most popular one right now in, in West Virginia is Newcore. If you look at Newcore landing in Mason County, Nucor will affect all the way down into Boone, Boone, shoot, Boone and Logan. Tripping over my tongue there, I created a couple of new counties. <laughs> um, Boone and Logan, um, it'll affect Wayne. It's going to affect Cabell. It's going to affect Putnam. It's going to affect Mason. It's going to affect, affect Kanawha, Jackson. It's got a large footprint of economic impact for the jobs that creates. And when you create those jobs in those communities, that money starts circulating in those communities. Now, what's happened, though, as more and more of these companies have come in and said, this is where we're going to be in West Virginia, it's getting more competitive for land in West Virginia, which means that you can only plant so many in Mason. You can only plant so many in Putnam, Cabell, Canal, or Eastern Panhandle because you get your, your available space is going down. But they still want to be in West Virginia, and, they, and at a level that they're willing to invest heavily to get wherever they can in West Virginia. And so you're going to start seeing that in some of these counties that haven't got to be the ones at the tip of the spear getting these investments. Eric, i got to jump in because we're just about out of time here. I appreciate yours this morning. If you had a final thought you wanted to finish, take 20 seconds and finish it, please. You know, um, I'm incredibly excited about West Virginia's future. Um, uh, there, there's hope on the streets. There's hope in this legislature, and we're excited uh, for what will move forward. And while everybody's a little uh, anxious about getting uh, – our new Senate president chosen and getting our governor's, all his executive team chosen. I can tell you my confidence is very high that we'll get it right. Thank you, Eric. Have a great day. You guys have a great day as well. Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr.